And we're going to listen now from Dr. Chris Watkin, um, the social contract of higher education. And Dr. Watkin is the Australian Research Council Fellow and Associate Professor in European Languages at Monash University, um, originally from Cambridge. His scholarship focuses on modern contemporary European thought, atheism, and the relationship between the Bible and philosophy. And he's recently released an award-winning book called Biblical Critical Theory. And um, I haven't read it yet, but it's a book that I've been told by so many people that I need to read it. It's one of those great uber books that seems to cover the, the full compass of human thinking. Um, so uh, make sure you get your hands on that one. Uh, I had, uh, I've, I've sat under a couple of Chris's uh, talks. I've always found them to be wonderful and, and rewarding uh, food for thought. So Chris, even though it's after lunch, uh, we're going to uh, welcome you now for a bit of dense critical thinking. Let's welcome um, Chris Watkin, The Social Contract on Higher Education. Thank you very much indeed, David. I'm honoured to be addressing you. I've been asked to say a few words contributing to a vision for faith-based higher education. And I've been asked to do so as someone who is not currently working in faith-based higher education. So that may mean that I have the fresh perspective of an outsider, or it may mean that I come over as incredibly naive. Uh, and I will leave it to you to decide which of those uh, is the impression uh, that I leave you with. I want to focus these thoughts through the lens of the social contract, the social contract of higher education. I want to do that for two reasons. First of all, I think it reminds us, as we have indeed been reminded throughout the proceedings so far, that institutions of higher education don't exist in a vacuum in society. Uh, they're part of a wider ecosystem of concerns and interests, and we need to think of them in that context. Social contract language also, I think, helps us to remember, and it's a really important thing to remember, that when it comes to thinking about institutions of higher education in society, or indeed any part of society, law and regulation can only take us a certain way, because there are intangibles, if you like, in society that underpin law and regulation and that make the sort of society that we live in possible. Things like trust and mutuality and responsibility, uh, shared concerns, things like the common good, without which we couldn't have the sort of society that we do. And I want to try and foreground those concerns and those aspects of the, the way we do living together here in Australia. Uh, as part of my uh, remarks today. I want, in fact, to focus on one problem that I think most people will be ready to admit is at the heart of our polity. And it is the, the, the problem uh, and the, the, the delight of finding the common good. Uh, how in such a richly and wonderfully diverse society as we have the pleasure of living in in Australia today, do we find a common good to which we can all contribute in society? And I want to think of that through a particular lens. I want to think of it through actually a particular word in the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Old Testament. It's a very rich, uh, profound word. And it's the word shalom. And it's sometimes translated peace. Uh, sometimes translated prosperity, uh, sometimes translated welfare. And it's the cognate of the Arabic salam, uh, in salam alaikum, peace be upon you. It's that idea of peace. But it's a deeper idea than simply the absence of hostilities, peace in that sense. It's, it's an idea that it's very hard to translate because it's a very comprehensive idea of a society functioning well in all its aspects and prospering in all its aspects. People able to fulfill themselves together in community in all the different ways that make us human. Uh, this is this captured in this idea of shalom. And through the lens of shalom, I want to try and focus two ideas 
And I hope that these might contribute in some way to, to shaping a sense of the, the place that institutions of faith-based higher education might have in our society today. Firstly, I, I want to try and argue that the shalom helps us to move towards a common good that is not oppositional. I'm going to try and explain what I mean by that. Secondly, shalom helps us to move towards a common good that is not an ultimate good. So in order to think about the sort of society um, uh, in which we live and, and how institutions of faith-based higher education might fit in it, I, I guess we need to ask the question at some point, how do we characterize our society today? And there are libraries of books that have been written on questions like that. I just want to choose one way of thinking about modern society. I'm getting it from a, a sociologist, Rebecca Costa. And she talks about modern Western societies in terms of what she calls the oppositional society. Now, this includes the idea that we are quite nasty to each other online and we oppose each other on social media quite a lot these days. And lest the academics in the room think that you're getting away from this, remember that the conversation closed its comment section for most of its articles recently because even academics can't relate in a civil way online to each other. So it includes that, but it's actually deeper than that. What Rebecca Costa is trying to put her finger on is the way in which we find our identity in society today, whether that's personal identity or group identity, in terms of what we oppose. We know who we are because we know what we're not and we know what we reject. And what this creates is a race to the extremes, uh, because we're each seeking, according to this thesis, to define ourselves in contradistinction to those people out there, and therefore we need to put clear blue water between us, and therefore positions get over time more and more extreme. And again, to the extent that this thesis is correct, it's a pathological path for a society to be going down, isn't it? It's hard to see how that way of doing society ends well. I want to try and show how the idea of, of shalom provides a different way of thinking about society. First of all, because it provides for us a common good that is not oppositional. Uh, let me read you how this idea of shalom works itself out in a particular real world situation. It's a very raw real world situation. It's the situation of um, the inhabitants of Judah taken into exile uh, by Babylon. Uh, and during that period, uh, in the book of Jeremiah, in the Hebrew scriptures, Jeremiah writes a letter to the exiles, uh, instructing them how to behave in this uh, situation of exile in which they find themselves. I just want to read you a brief extract from that letter because it crystallizes, I think, what Shalom looks like on the ground in a real world situation. So Jeremiah 29, verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity, the shalom is the word that that's translating. Seek the shalom of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, shalom word again, you too will prosper, shalom. So that's our paradigm. What does that mean for institutions of faith-based higher education today in Australia? Well, those of you who, like me, work in the higher education sector will probably be familiar with the debate that's happening in our sector at the moment. And it's actually a microcosm of a debate that's happening more broadly in society, part of the so-called uh, culture wars. It's a debate between two forms of understanding how we produce knowledge and what knowledge is. On the one hand, you've got what we might call the Enlightenment universalist approach. 
According to this approach, anyone whatsoever, whoever they are, if they are of good will and use the right methodology, will come to the same conclusions, uh, will arrive at the same knowledge. It often comes bundled together with an idea of, for example, the great books, that it is able objectively to say the best that has been thought in history, and, and it elevates these, these great books and says these are the, the, the markers, the, the measures to which we must seek to aspire. Um, Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, um, Descartes, and so forth. But there's a second approach to knowledge that's risen to prominence perhaps in the last 40 or so years. It was bubbling up in the 70s. It really crystallized in the mid 80s. And it crystallized in Sandra Harding's idea of standpoint epistemology. So the idea here is that different people have a different experience of the world. If I'm not a woman, I do not know what it is like to be a woman. If I'm not black, I don't know what it's like to be black. But all of our knowledge has been produced, by and large, by people who come from a particular standpoint. And so what we need to do is diversify the standpoints from which we're drawing our sense of what knowledge is. And Harding and others talk about, therefore, an epistemic privilege. Uh, we should privilege those voices that have been on the margins up until now because they will have different perspectives and different things to offer in terms of what we count as knowledge. And this often comes bundled together with what today is often called the decolonizing of the curriculum. Uh, we should seek both in the texts that we study in higher education and in the modes of engagement with those texts to bring into the center those methodologies and those bodies of knowledge that have thus far, the argument goes, been marginalized in the academy. And so you've got these two ideas of knowledge, these two incompatible ideas of knowledge, in many ways fighting it out in the academy today. The light that is shone on these by Shalom, I think, leads us to a really interesting conclusion. And it's that despite appearances, these two very superficially different modes of knowledge have actually more in common than perhaps either of them would like to admit. And first of all, they're both somewhat partial. It is often irksome to proponents of the Enlightenment Universalist model to remind them that most people in the history of the world and most people today do not produce knowledge in this way that it is relatively recent to emerge on the scene, and that it has a history. Um, it's brought in largely with, with René Descartes. Uh, John Locke is key uh, in its development, and so forth. Uh, and it does seem to privilege one way of arriving at knowledge, that however one might like to cut and dice, it is culturally specific, did arise within a particular cultural heritage. But there's also a partiality to the standpoint position, which is that there seem to be de facto certain standpoints, certain perspectives that are privileged for inclusion in the body of knowledge and, and others that remain unnoted, uh, that remain outside the pale of those perspectives that, that we're wanting to, uh, to do justice to today. Uh, for example, Marxists will often critique standpoint epistemology because it doesn't engage with or it doesn't seem to notice uh, the poor, uh, the destitute in society, for example. What light does Shalom um, shed on, on this difference? Well, I think it's really interesting because Shalom doesn't assume, in the, the passage that I read out, that everybody thinks the same. There's a clear distinction between the Hebrews in exile and the Babylonian ideology. There's no sense that those two should be or can be merged. But yet, neither is there an incommensurability of perspectives either. Work for the peace and prosperity, the shalom of the city into which I've sent you in exile, because in its shalom you will find your shalom 
there's a commonality there. Dare we say it, there's a common good that can be sought in that context. And I think that cuts across this distinction and this debate in contemporary academia between either this single Enlightenment universalist model of knowledge or the standpoint decolonizing model of knowledge. But there's another reason, perhaps even a deeper reason, why this perspective of shalom I think is incredibly healthy today. Think about the last Australian census in 2021. Uh, the number of people identifying as having no belief, no, no religious affiliation uh, in the country, I think was 38.9%. So if we assume unbelief, we're speaking to fewer than one in four Australians. And yet, both of these ways of constructing knowledge tend to assume unbelief. It is rare for decolonizing, for example, to include de-secularizing, although many of the marginalized epistemologies, the indigenous epistemologies, are profoundly faith-based in their orientation. So it would seem that any genuine decolonizing, any authentic decolonizing, must include de-secularizing. And in the same way that we wouldn't simply want to learn about indigenous knowledge from a text and practice it as non-indigenous people, thinking that we have done enough, but uh, the, the impetus at the moment is to invite indigenous people into the lecture room, into the courses, to, to share their knowledge. Well, in the same way, we wouldn't want to de-secularize the curriculum without those who in the first person occupy these faith positions. And who are they? They're those who live and work and minister in faith-based institutions of higher education in this country, uh, who can therefore play a crucial role in this necessary task of de-secularizing the curriculum uh, in order to make the, the modern and current trend to try and broaden the spectrum uh, of positions that are represented in higher education uh, richer and fuller, and to represent those almost six in ten Australians who affiliate with a particular faith-based position. So that was my first point. Uh, there is a common good that is not oppositional. There's no sense in that shalom passage from Jeremiah, is there, uh, that it's a zero-sum game between the exiles and Babylon. Work for the peace and prosperity of the city into which I've called you in exile, because in their shalom, you will find your shalom. That is not opposition on. That is radical. That is subversive today. But there's a necessary second point as well. There's a common good that is not oppositional because it's a common good that is not an ultimate good. It's a common good that's not oppositional because it's a common good that's not an ultimate good. What is the basis upon which our multicultural plural society is built? Let's simplify it and say there are two options. Uh, one option, which I think is the option often presented to us today, is that there must be agreement on ultimate goods, on our ultimate values, our deep core values, and then there's a sense that we can differ on the proximate values um, by which we hope to mean those core, uh, attain those core values. It's really curious, I think, in this passage from Jeremiah, that it seems to be exactly the opposite. There's no sense that the Hebrew exiles need to adopt a Babylonian ideology. Uh, Jeremiah is not saying to them, become indistinguishable from the Babylonians, think like they do, seek what they seek, love what they love. And yet, there's a, a proximate common good, so to speak, that can be sought. One can work for the peace and prosperity of Babylon without becoming just like the Babylonians. Now, in the history of um, Christian thought, this idea has, has been worked over, and one particular vivid expression of it is in um, Augustine of Hippo's idea of what he calls splendid vices. 
So he's trying to work out how to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. And he says, there are certain ultimate goods that Rome has that, that as Christians, Augustine is saying, I wouldn't want to agree with, but that nevertheless have some collateral benefits for society. He takes Roman glory, gloria, as one of his examples. Now, Roman glory is a very brutal value. Uh, it's the value of subduing other peoples and bringing their tributes back to Rome and going in triumphal procession through the, the streets of Rome uh, in, in, in a great show of glory. It, it is not something with which the Christian would want to resonate. And yet, Augustine says, for all its ugliness, a society that is built around glory saves itself from other vices. Chaos, for example. There's a certain order and structure to society that comes from Gloria. And therefore, he, it's a splendid vice in the sense that it saves the society from things that could be worse. We might think of peace similarly. Peace is better than war. Uh, we may differ on the um, reasons why we might be for peace, but as a proximate good, it would seem uh, that that is something that can be largely shared. So, back to Christian institutions of higher education. Where do they fit into this big picture? Well, I think this idea of shalom as a common good that is not an ultimate good positions institutions of faith-based higher education in society in a way that avoids two pitfalls, two opposite pitfalls. The first is isolation. We do not share the ultimate values of society, therefore we must withdraw from society. Pull up the drawbridge, preach to the choir, serve our own community. But that falls short, doesn't it, of this vision of shalom. In Jeremiah 29, work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I've called you. There's something deficient in that isolationist position. The equal and opposite temptation is the temptation of assimilation. And it's not just a temptation for faith-based institutions of higher education today. It's actually a temptation for all higher education. Either assimilate to a particular political agenda, whether that's becoming an instrument of the government in power at the moment, or equally becoming something like the unofficial opposition that sees it as its purpose to campaign and advocate against the government. They're just mirror images of each other, aren't they? Or to become joined at the hip to corporate interests. Uh, and when the corporate world says jump, the academia simply asks how high. That seems equally deficient as a way to embody this principle of shalom. Because, as anyone who's watched any of Shakespeare's history plays will know, uh, a king who surrounds himself with flatterers does not end well. And therefore, a society where there isn't a vibrant scrutiny and critical voice to either the, the corporate sector or the, or the political class is not a society that will end well. And we know this in boardrooms as well, don't we? Uh, boardrooms that are composed of middle-aged white men who dress the same and all went to the same handful of universities are more than likely to make worse decisions than boardrooms that have a diversity of perspectives represented in them. This has been proven in the statistics. And so Shalom positions us neither as isolationists nor as assimilationists, but as what we might call common good critics. In other words, the, the faith-based higher education and the institutions of higher education more broadly reserve the right and the freedom and the ability to critique the other institutions of society, whether they be corporate or, or governmental. But that is done not simply out of a desire to oppose, but out of a deeper searching for the common good and a deeper treasuring for the common of, of the common good. And I think this is where Shalom positions us in society as common good critics, criticizing for the sake of building a better, more inclusive uh, society for everybody. So where have we got to in terms of thinking of this, this, these broad brush strokes for a vision for faith-based higher education? Well, I think faith-based higher education is in an unusually propitious position 
to search for and articulate and put forward indeed a metaphysical basis for a common good that is not oppositional. And that in our particular cultural moment is incredibly healthy and precious and valuable as a contribution to society. And faith-based higher education is also able to, and in a good position, to articulate a common good that is not an ultimate good. And the benefit of this, of course, is it allows for a real deep pluralism. Because our understanding of what the greatest good is, the ultimate good in society, will be different. It differs even among secular people of different ideologies. And then how much more does it differ between different religious outlooks? We will not agree on the ultimate good uh, in any more than a pro forma sense. And yet, as Augustine shows in The City of God, it is possible and desirable to agree on the proximate goods and on that basis to build a society, rather than the, the model that we're often given today, which is that you either agree on the ultimate goods or society fragments and fractures. I don't think those are the only two options. And I think Shalom, Jeremiah's letters to the exiles in Augustine, City of God, show us a healthier model for a truly multicultural, truly pluralist, pluralistic society in which faith-based higher education is playing a leading role in de-secularizing the curriculum and in representing those almost six out of ten Australians who didn't tick the box saying, I have no religious affiliation. So those are my views from the outside, if you were, uh, my contributions uh, to an eventual uh, vision. And it's over to you to decide uh, whether you think uh, they're the, the fresh remarks uh, of someone looking from the outside or whether you think they're just incredibly naive. Thank you. Common good critics. I think that's a wonderful phrase, isn't it? I'm going to use that one again. I'll, I'll attribute it to you. Um, uh, do we have a couple of questions? Yeah, Gil. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was absolutely fantastic. I enjoyed it enormously. Um, I'd have to remind you that um, Socrates was a common good critic, um, and that didn't end up well for him. <laughs> and neither did it end up well for Peter Ridd, as we heard earlier today. You and I were talking earlier, and I 100% endorse everything that you were saying, but I do feel that something else is required of all of us um, and that is a degree of courage. Uh, I think the time has come that we have to be prepared to, to stand up and represent those six out of ten. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that the six out of ten that said they, were, they had some religious affiliation really meant it sincerely, but whatever the correct figure is, it's a very large proportion. Um, but I don't think we've been brave enough as faith-based people to actually present our position, and therefore we've allowed the secularist approach to, to take over. So I'm wondering what we can do to be that common good gadfly. Thank you so much, Gil. It's a really, really profound comment. I think that there are a spectrum of ways, um, just speaking from my own tradition in, in the Christian Bible of engaging with society, and the, the wisdom, to use a word that, that's been used in this context already today, is in choosing the right mode of engagement for the right moment. Um, so if we think, for example, about the prophetic stance, which is one of often proclamation, denunciation, shouting loudly about things in public. Um, and then there's also the, the stance that's perhaps more indicative of the, the wisdom books uh, of the Hebrew Bible, which is more sort of living in the cracks of society. I'm using Michael Waltz's reading of the, the wisdom literature here. And uh, sort of getting by in a Daniel sort of way, going with the flow but having one's red lines. I think the, the $64,000 question is knowing which of those stances is appropriate for a particular moment. Uh, and to sort of bring it into the New Testament, we have the, yeah, the Jesus who, when the woman is caught in adultery, stoops down and writes in the sand. He doesn't accuse. And we've got the Jesus who gives both barrels to the Pharisees and rips shreds off them 
One can imagine him even shouting at them in those passages. And again, the wisdom is being able to play that whole keyboard and knowing which <laughs> note to play at which moment. Um, and I think it's called wisdom for, for a reason, isn't it? it? We often, I fear, uh, speaking just from my own tradition, I think we treat the Pharisees as if they were women at the well or were the women caught in adultery, and we treat the women caught in adultery as if they were Pharisees. In other words, we shout at the wrong people and we meek with the wrong people. Uh, and the, the wisdom is, is getting that pitch perfect, and which we never will, but it's, it's trying to approximate towards modes of engagement that fit the situation perhaps better than my own tradition has a history of doing. Do we have a further question? Yeah, over here, Jesse. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Always good to be furnished with anything that can help us to subvert the culture wars uh, and the role we can play within it. I'm just wondering, I followed your logic all the way through, uh, except there was, I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about why you think any true decolonialising um, must uh, include de-secularising. I'm intrigued by that, and can you speak more about that, please, and explain it? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Because a lot of the colonial epistemologies are profoundly faith-based. It is a peculiarity of human history that, that the Enlightenment Universalist model has itself as a secularized way of arriving at knowledge. Most ways of arriving at knowledge, historically speaking, have had a religious aspect to them. And so to think that we can desecularize the curriculum without taking account of that the inherently, inextricably faith-based basis of, of these indigenous forms of knowledge or these non-Western forms of knowledge, I think is a, is a dangerous naivety. Does that help? We can't, yeah, thank you. We can't properly decolonize without de secularizing, is my point. Is that? I get the point. Yes. I'll okay. We are, uh, are actually at time. Um, so I might, uh, I might uh, call, call the questions to a close. And, um, folks, what a wonderful. Um, Again, a wonderful, rich, deep dive.